Welcome to Crossroads TV, where we host China experts here on the ground in Shanghai. My name is Frank Tsai, and I've run China Crossroads offline talks with these experts for over 13 years. And we're finally uh, putting this online on YouTube because we feel that, frankly, the quality of China dialogue in the world is getting worse just as China is becoming uh, more important and, and, frankly, more threatening to many around the world. Uh, all of our speakers, all of our guests uh, will be former speakers and experts with uh, long expertise in China. Uh, first, let's welcome our co-host Sven Agton, a uh, prominent business person here in Shanghai, also the author of Adventures in China's Economy. Really happy to be welcoming our guest, Peter Hansen, who is the director of Sense China, Thank a you. almost 20-year veteran of China and author of Asia's Trade Routes. Mål, ja. Han svarer til uh, Kina, as it's called in Danish, my native language. Unfortunately, it's not out in uh, English yet. Who yes. knows? Yes. Nobody knows, yeah. So, Peter, you're from Denmark. I'm from Belgium. Two relatively small countries. I think six million people in Denmark. Just about. Belgium is now 11, I believe. Used to be 10, a bit higher now. So, when I was in Belgium for the holidays, basically, I mean, China is, of course, more prominent than it used to be before. America is still, of course, the big thing nowadays. But if you are in Denmark or when you talk to European business leaders in general, how do you think now the sentiment towards China is at this very moment after all these years of COVID and everything? Well, in a word, negative, but uh, within relative terms, uh, not as negative as in in in, the, uh, in America, for instance, but definitely more negative than it was before all these things started. Uh, for the the core business community, the ones that we deal with in my organization, we have twenty thousand member companies. You can say it's it's split up into two groups. One group was the ones that were always critical critical of, of China doing business with China and the Danish relationship to China in general, they have perhaps got, gotten a little bit bigger and their voice has become stronger than, uh, than before. The other group are the, the many, still thousands of Danish companies that have business interest in China and still want to, to, to remain present uh, in China or at least deal with China. They are perhaps not as vocal as they used to be, but they're still keen on, on getting their message through that, 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 that China is, uh, is a place to be for Danish business. Is it then very true? Because that's what I sometimes notice that it used to be that China was less sensitive in many ways, not so much more sensitive, of course, that I think still biz many business people still want to come to China and they still need to meet the first foreign company says, I don't want to go to China. They just don't say it anymore. Well, I, th I think they do, but, but there's also a reality that these few years and all the geopolitical tensions and, and of course, uh, some other developments have put a pressure on some companies that would like to be in China, but perhaps now feel China is no longer for them. We, we can see that, that, that there is suddenly being a partition between larger companies and small and medium sized enterprises from Denmark. And that gap may be expanding, or I, I think it, it surely will be. The SMEs have a tough time in China, and they are afraid that they will have an even tougher time. They are also not as well geared as the big companies to protect themselves from uh, external pressures, for instance, uh, investing full on in the, the China for China business strategies. That's, that's, that's you could say now, the, the, the most efficient model. Product. That's not really doable for an, uh, a Danish SME. They don't have the resources to do that. So they are a little bit more reluctant about China, and we have also seen an exit from quite a few of our companies on for that reason. They didn't want to leave, but they had to leave. So in that aspect, when you talk to these Danish companies or European companies in general, the SME level, do you feel that they still understand what's happening in China at the very moment? Because even for us being here on the ground every day, it's still sometimes hard to really see what's because mm. so many things are still happening in China, of course. So how can you start from no, they, outside China? They don't have the, the a clear picture. They don't have the full picture for sure. I mean, they they. they they invest in in understanding uh, China better. That's that's also why the three of us uh, have a have a business here because there is this interest in in understanding China from from that group of uh, companies. But it's still difficult, and they are still under they're still being affected by in my country the relatively negative public opinion that is surrounding China these years. It is 
in, almost impossible for the average person working in a company that deals with China not to always also feel a little bit the pressure mm -hmm. from his, his or her surroundings about why are you in China? Why do you guys continue to work with China when, when, uh, when, the, when the world is as it is? So since China is part of the Danish Confederation of Industry and you're speaking to Danish business people all the time about China, and as you know, I was in Copenhagen for two weeks recently uh, talking to Danish people about China and uh, was really struck by their uh, negativity and uh, kind of risk aversion. Uh, interestingly, they, they, they loved, had many opinions about the United States, but for China, it was a kind of, you know, blanket negative view and then not much deeper than that. Mm. And I wonder if you could speak a little more in depth about um, you know, the factors uh, causing this, but also some of the changes that uh, have caused this in the last few years. Well, I mean, I think that when I, when I moved first to China, uh, there was this, you know, I, I first moved here 25 years ago. And uh, as, as you say, you were, I've been here for almost 20 in total. For the first many years, China was super popular. It was the place to go. There were a lot of young people coming out here and, and a lot of business entrepreneurs that wanted to, to, to make their business. China was a, a positive story. Yeah. What has happened is probably that many Westerners, including the Danish business people, have fallen a little bit out of love with China. Mm -hmm. and, and again, then we are back to this thing about perception. The perception in the Danish public opinion is that China is not a good place and the Chinese leadership are not good people or whatever right. and that sort of have has a, a spillover effect also on on on, on the business uh, community and and on the potential people who potentially would like to invest and who's still interested in china perhaps they are a little bit more risk averse and and and, and not going to do it. that that is the current situation it can change for yeah, sure yeah. but that is the current uh, situation as i see it so when you're talking to your members i mean what kind of arguments what kind of points do you make to try to help them understand the reality of China. Uh, just to, you know, just as an aside, none of us are saying that we, we love the regime here, but that's uh, separate, mm -hmm. you know, from business uh, very often in China. So how, how do you make those points to your members? Facts, facts, facts. We actually, every time there is a discussion uh, in Danish media and public opinion about the Danish business potential or the business community's potential in China, we actually try to bring the facts to the table. China is now Denmark's fifth largest uh, export market. It's a massive, uh, ob obviously, supply chain uh, uh, destination for many Danish companies. And, and in also many other ways, China is deeply integrated in the Danish economy. We have numbers and statistics and data on how deeply integrated we know the job creation that China brings to Denmark. And we try to present those facts in a in a, in a clear and objective way to whoever we speak to, so that it's not only the emotional part of the di discussion that's, uh, that, that, that's, that's winning the argument. So facts, and it does have an effect. There are many that, you know, after hearing what is it actually that China means to the Danish economy, perhaps also becomes a little bit more nuanced and balanced in their uh, opinions. Well, you spoke for us last year about decoupling and de-risking uh, China and Europe. And, you know, when I was in Copenhagen, uh, part of our workshop was to give a scenario. What if there is a, a Taiwan-U.S. Uh, or sorry, a China-U.S. Uh, conflict about Taiwan, for example, uh, sanctions against uh, China because of a blockade or even uh, worse measures? And when I spoke to the, uh, the business people in Denmark, I was saying, well, you better prepare for this because even if there are great prospects or underappreciated prospects for China business, there's always that looming risk that we could have this big geopolitical uh, crisis. And, you know, to my mind, uh, you, know, m you know, very likely Denmark's going to also sanction China if mm. America applies that pressure. Uh, so I mean, how do you speak about that big geopolitical risk? But well, we, we, we try to speak about it openly and, and of course also get some feedback from the companies. Is there a plan B? Is there a contingency plan right. to uh, to your investment? This whole China plus one strategy, how much does that mean in reality for you? Are you trying to reduce dependency on China or is it simply just, uh, you know, uh, to, 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 uh, to expand your markets or whatever is it? So, so the, the, the discussion is, uh, is there. We try to uh, talk about it on, uh, again, based on the basic facts, whether or not that it's actually having an impact on, uh, uh, yeah. on our target group, which means our members. Right. Well, I, I can't say for sure. Mm -hmm. Do you think then that this kind of uh, what the European Union says or what the European Chamber of Commerce says, we need to do risk, 
but we're not leaving China. Mm. Now, we've been in China for a long time, 20 years, we've been in 20 years also. I think China is a, very, is a country where you have to be very realistic about things. Ideology is not always at first, it's more about realism in this country. Yeah. If you tell to a Chinese, well, you should do this, this and this, but yeah, we're not leaving anyway. What message do you then really give to the Chinese? In my opinion, it's like, well, would we change because you're not leaving anyway? I, but is that still the case? I would have, I, I would agree with, I would have agreed with you until recently. But I do feel that the pressures are mounting. Mm. I mean, even the European Union, who is no, uh, notoriously uh, unwilling to set what they call red lines, have now established a bunch of red lines when it comes to China. And say, if this is crossed, then we have to, you know, do something about it. And what we do about it could be quite. Uh, uh, you know, uh, could could be quite critical for for European business simply because it's a question of our own survival. It's a question of our own morals, values, ethics, and all these things. Now, this actually, I feel, is the meaning of this is getting a little bit more profound than it was before, where it was basically just talk. But I, I do think that the times are changing. I do think that some of the the pressures that are being added to China from the Western world is more sincere. Taiwan is a big. Part of that because two years ago, none of us thought that Russia would ever uh, invade uh, Ukraine. It happened. And what was the immediate consequence for the business community? Loss and loss of money. I mean, Danish companies have lost a lot of money in Russia because they've been forced out of there. And could the same happen in China? That's what we're all thinking now. Yeah, it could obviously happen. And what would that mean to, uh, to, to, to our business? So that is definitely something that's on the mind of uh, Danish companies. Yeah. So from, from their perspective, from, from these European or Danish companies, on the one hand, they say, OK, China, we need to do risk at a very, very clear point. Then, of course, there's the Russia problem, which, of course, is very direct from with, 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 with Europe, basically. Then, of course, you have a Trump who recently said, oh, well, if Europe gets attacked, we won't defend you. Mm. So it looks to me that Europe is being attacked from different sides. So how do they react? And I mean, at the end of the day, as a small country, mm. as Belgium and Denmark, and as an SME, you need to sell your products, whatever you're selling all over the world. You need to be friends with almost everybody. So how can you really manage all these risks at the moment? It's well, not only China, it's, it's, it's the whole world nowadays. I feel that, and, and you, uh, being European, can can you know perhaps also recognize that. I feel there that there is a renewed discussion of Europe having to step into character again. We've we've been under a law for too many years. We have the you we have the protection, the military protection from America, and we, you know, we only really have to focus on what's going on in our own little circle. We have so much. Uh, there are 28 member states in EU, and that's really enough for many, uh, many of the companies and people. You know, that's that that's the focus. For now, it's like okay, we are being pushed into taking some action, even on the military side, and uh, and and the Trump factor is big. China is not a big factor in that because at the end of the day, not a lot of people actually think that China is a threat to Denmark or Europe in in, in the way. Trump factor is one. Can we rely? on U.S. support if something happens. And then, of course, Russia is the major threat in this uh, respect. There is a war in Europe right now. It could expand. We don't know what's going to happen. Can we even protect ourselves? So so there's been a change of uh, mind that I think will probably get stronger uh, going, uh, going forward. Do the Danish companies think that, of course, nowadays there's the whole story about the Chinese electrical vehicle manufacturers going to Europe and selling the cars there. And of course, it's in the rise and everything. We see Volkswagen and Stellantis who have to buy into Chinese technology even to catch up now mm. with this new trend. And you know, China was the biggest car market in the world. I think Volkswagen sold 40% of their cars in China. And I've asked the question before to other people. They have missed out on that, obviously. Yeah. They have to catch up. So technologically, China is in many ways competing with Europe. I'm not talking about <laughs> war, political, whatever. it's technology. How do Danish companies look at that. Do they feel like, Jesus, we have to step it up here? Or like, well, it's still far away. Well, now Denmark is not really a, a, a big, big, uh, big player in the in the in the kind, so we don't have our own brands. Uh, but if you take it in, in, in broader terms, I think what, what's happening in the car industry right now is is pretty interesting uh, on, on 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 both sides. I mean, years ago we. Uh, China invested big time in becoming the new Korea or Japan in uh, in in the car 
uh, you know, getting a global uh, standing in the in the car industry the same way that the, the neighbor countries did. That was complete failure. There are almost no Chinese brands that have traditional Chinese brands that have actually made it into the global markets. They revised their way of thinking, and now they said, okay, if we can't have uh, cars 1.0, then we're going to be the leader in cars mm. 2.0. And for sure, there's a lot of uh, uh, government backing to that. On the other side, then you had the European brands, the Germans mostly perhaps, who say, well, look at it, they, they are not, they're not a threat to us. They are not good enough. They, you know, our brand, our standing is so strong. And perhaps that's why they have not really invested in the 2.0 uh, part of the part, part of the uh, car uh, industry. They could catch up quickly. And I, I think we should not be too scared of uh, of seeing the European car industry completely uh, suddenly disappear. There are some pretty strong brands there. There are a lot of mm. car Europeans and people uh, elsewhere in the world that that are still pretty tied to those brands. So, but they got to catch up. They have to find a way to uh, to uh, to deal with the Chinese on the EV side. And yeah, the Economist had a whole briefing, like a ten-page briefing, on just this issue just yesterday. And I'm always surprised, you know, so China is the world's largest car manufacturer, uh, exporter, but it's never mentioned in these articles that, you know, a lot of these are, are Western branded car brands and the Chinese brands themselves, uh, it's not going to be more than half of the exports from China. Very interesting the way the media works when it reports on China. Sure. No, I, I agree. But again, it's the, the, the way it's being presented is, of course, the, Europe, uh, the Chinese car makers and car brands are going to take over our pillar industry, our number one pillar industry. Right, right. Uh, and you know, they're gonna, uh, we, we're not gonna, we, we, if we want a car, it has to be a Chinese car in the future. That is a, that is a good story from a media perspective. So for sure, that's being pushed uh, a lot. But obviously, the reality is a lot more uh, balanced than that. Yeah. You know, we're very conscious of the fact that we've been here in China a long time. So that's 20 years for Peter, 15 for me, and 20 for Sven. That's 55 years. And so, you know, we like to think that we uh, therefore have insight uh, because we have such experience. Now, some others may uh, say that we're too bought in uh, and we're too close to the subject and can't see China objectively. Uh, I, I think the two of us have had that accusation before. I mean, I wonder what people say, uh, what you say to people who think that you've been here too long or have too much expertise here. Peter, do you suffer from the Stockholm Syndrome? <laughs> Are you paid exactly. by the CCP? That is exactly <laughs> what, what I hear from time. So why are you yeah, always right. defending China? Are you, yeah. have you been there too long? Are, are you on the you payroll? See, are you seeing it from a rational perspective? Yes. Right, Look, right, right. I, I haven't gotten the one, are you actually on the payroll of mm. the Chinese? I had it once. That, not that far. I had it once, I did say, <laughs> I wish it was on the payroll. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> No, but uh, I, I agree with you. I mean, uh, there's a lot of uh, a growing suspicion around why, why are you there? And you know, are you are you actually balanced yourself when you talk about China, or are you under the uh, impact of what you hear and what you learn from uh, from from the Chinese side? Do you see the world as it is? And I think that's uh, that's an interesting discussion, you know. But because who knows? Perhaps we are as unbalanced that we sometimes feel that the well we all have an interest in china's uh, business economy thriving because we work here so that's you know one criticism you can level at us but I, I think a lot of it's lack of nuance right i mean there's the central government there's the shanghai government there's local uh, governments uh, there's foreign policy all these things are different right and so uh, y you can feel as we do that there's a lot of dynamism in china a lot of opportunities while also criticizing other aspects of chinese behavior it's all consistent we're just uh, a little bit closer to the subject right? mm. I think there's always one thing which always strikes me that consistently, I think that's changing now, consistent with the last 30 years, a lot of foreigners in general have un always underestimated China. Or well, first we got a manufacturer by, oh, they can't produce good quality. And then the middle class came by, yeah, but yeah, they're not sophisticated like us, right? Mm. And China innovation, they, they can't innovate like us. Right? And, and every time China has stepped up the mark and there they are. Absolutely. And is I do you think that in Europe they're now maybe like, actually, yeah, I mean, they are really, you know, so, I mean, the, the word I've heard the most the last few years is we have been naive about China. Mm. And uh, that naivety both goes to the political side and to what China actually can achieve in terms of, uh, of uh, you know, economic and technological progress. I think, I think the, the reality has seeped in. 
uh, China is a tough competitor. It's a systemic rival, as the European Union has now dubbed it. And in terms of that, it could also be uh, a military threat in the future to our whole existence. All these things. I, I think that there's there's no more naivety uh, mm. going on there. Now, right. now the pendulum has perhaps switched too far on the other side. Now it's it's one big. Uh, painting of, uh, of of threat and suspicion when it comes to China, where it's it's really our job again to then counter it and say no 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 come on, there's 1.4 billion people in China they're not all looking to uh, <laughs> you know right. to 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 change our way of uh, life, so I think that's an important part of 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 what of being out here to relay the balanced perspectives right. And do you think you're being listened to? Yeah, I, I do feel, I do feel uh, we are. I mean, I think there's an interest in learning about China, uh, for sure. Uh, and and, and I, I say again, in my little world, I, I work with the, the businesses. They do still want to learn. They want to hear. They want to, they're interested, not just in how their business will be impacted immediately, but also in the grander scales of things. I also feel that public opinion can be swayed. Yeah. In at least in, in in my little country, perhaps it's tougher in the in the states, but uh, it can't be swayed by actually trying to come up and, and and tell some stories about this is also the reality of China. Yeah. The interesting thing is when I'm back in Belgium and my wife is Chinese and you meet regular normal people, not even friends, but you go to the bank and say, oh, I live in China. Oh, I live in China. That's interesting. They're always interested to know what's happening in China. So the one perspective, it's like in the media, this. But into normal people, and they they quite I think very interested still in what what's happening. So there are very different layers in the whole China story. I, I all agree, the time. Yeah. and that is again actually also yeah I I totally agree that it's a little bit the ambivalent thing here. Ooh, on one hand, it might be a danger, but on the other hand, it's also interesting and exotic. And that thing, thankfully, is still there. It hasn't completely that interest in in Chinese culture and China as a as a foreign and exotic country is still there somewhere. So so we got to push it a a, a a little bit. How how Real, do you think that you know China wants to build a few global champions and 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 in certain sectors they want to be world leaders? How real do you think they can really be that? Because in my opinion, first of all, many companies are still have a kind of traditional roots, and very often the CEO and the top management does speak only Chinese often. So that's not really the language which can be done tonight. Very often they're also not that well international first yet, mm. although they might have good technology and innovation. So, I mean, there's still many factors which actually, I think, belong them to really become global players. In my opinion, I don't see them so quickly become having a huge global impact, regionally for sure, but that's how I think about yeah, it. Yeah, I, I think you, you could be right, and, and I don't see a lot, except for the industry we just talked about before, yeah, the EV right, industry. Right. There's no doubt that the Chinese uh, government and also local governments now that there isn't a province in China that doesn't have its own three or four uh, EV brands that they want to push into. The I mean, for sure, China has seen a window of opportunity here. You know, it's an incredibly important industry with with cluster formations that, uh, you know, uh, go through uh, an entire national economy. Uh, and, and China has seen a way to be the market leader here, to be the future leader here. And some of these companies, Xpeng, BYD, NIO, have probably also think, yeah, but could we be the number one of these market mm. leaders? Could we be the new Volkswagen or BMW? It's it's definitely a reality. So, uh, or a, a definitely a possibility, right? So I think in the car, EV industry, that, that could be Chinese global champions. Yeah. But does it then mean that Europe actually has to change its policy? Because now they say, ah, the European Union has started its investigation about whether the Chinese EV manufacturers have been state subsidies, mm. right, basically. Now, I think, I think it's quite, well known that the German economy has also been state, state subsidized. Mm -hmm. And by the way, one third of the European budget goes to the farm industry. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm thinking, what's the difference? Didn't we just put the money in the wrong places in the past? Well, China has put it in the right place. Is that the conclusion? I think that there are some differences there when it comes to the way subsidies are being used in farming industry. It has mostly been to, to align the different member states because they are very different income levels. But there is double standards here because uh, subsidies are used in the European industry. And the other double standard, which we also discussing a lot in, in Denmark, is it's all about green transition now. And we all want to make the life, uh, the world a greener place and, and, and cost is part of that. If the Chinese has a lead in actually uh, on the technology side, on the battery side, on, on doing it, should we not be allowed to import those Chinese cars that can make uh, our uh, roads and uh, communities a little greener. Yeah. So, so there is that. There is that 
yeah, you can call it double standard, but it's being discussed out in the open uh, for, for sure in, in many European con uh, countries. Yeah, this is a great discussion because it goes to the heart of a lot of issues about China, especially I think some misconceptions about uh, China as well. So uh, does China have a different system, a different uh, model of state planning and industrial development? Uh, certainly. Uh, is it a centralized one party state? Certainly. That doesn't mean, though, that everything is you know, coordinated in, in a way that, that we fear, uh, number one. Number two, if you look at uh, China's brands abroad, the globalization of its company, speaking to your point, Sven, I mean, China is behind uh, South Korea, for example, at a similar stage of development with global brands around the world. Uh, so, you know, in some ways, I think the Americans like to paint the picture of this coordinated, you know, master plan of China taking over the world. But the last uh, 20, 25 years, haven't really borne that out. I mean, one example would just be aircraft manufacturers in China, which have gone nowhere, for example. So it's a complicated story, uh, and there's truth to both sides, but I think this kind of nuance is very important. I agree, yeah. and just one comment there that I often also try to, uh, to, to, to put in the discussion when we have uh, this, you know, you say the grand master plan. I totally agree. A lot of Westerners especially think there is some grand uh, master plan where everybody's just pawns. Uh, and they don't understand that most things happen in China due to intense, extreme domestic competition. Right. And then, you know, the EV industry again, why do Chinese brands have to sell their com uh, companies, uh, you know, overseas at dumped subsidized prices because the domestic competition is is killing a lot of them right so uh, so so and that the same is true for, for for several other industries that the domestic competition in china is actually the main driver right. for many of these developments and policies that we see it's a different model worth understanding that's why we do this i uh, gotta thank uh, peter for being our guest uh, you know online for the first time and uh Thanks again, Sven. You have any final thoughts or comments, Sven? Uh, one last question. <laughs> this is a very open and difficult question. What is the future of the European China business relationships? I think it's good. I, I think it's positive. I think we are, we'll go through some, uh, some tough years here. Uh, unless something very uh, troubling happens on the political scene, I'm sure we will uh, we'll find common ways again because there is the, that, that interest. I think even the Europeans have now taken over this Chinese government's mantra. We may not have shared values, but we have common interests, so let's focus on them. You didn't hear that from Europe, uh, European business, uh, political leaders a few years ago, but now actually even the Danish prime minister has said something like that. And I think that's positive. In my analysis, you can look at some of this visa opening the European countries from China. I think China needs Europe more because America is definitely dead set on decoupling and reducing its reliance. So, I mean, China has to have advanced economy partners in the world. And uh, I, I think it's advantageous now for Europe to be dealing with China. I think so, too. I agree. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.